You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Welcome to the Foundry Church. As we get going today, I'd like to introduce Matt Kuman to you. Matt is somebody I've known most of his life. He was a student in the youth ministry that I was, uh, I was the youth director of for a number of years. I've known him for a long time, and I'm excited to have Matt here teaching for us today. Would you join me in welcoming Matt Kuman to the stage? Hey everybody, my name is Matt Kuman, and I am so excited to be with you guys today. Uh, when Eric told me that I could preach on Palm Sunday, I was so excited because there's just so much to unpack in the scripture that we're going to be diving into. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, like I said, my name is Matt Kuman, and I uh, graduated from Zealand East High School. <laughs> Go Chicks, absolutely. Uh, where I met my wife, Jalyn. Uh, we've been married for three years now. Uh, we just got back from the Grand Canyon a few weeks ago with my family. Uh, we had a blast out there. And after I graduated from Zealand East, from being a chick in high school, I moved on to being a cougar in college. Yeah, kind of a weird, weird correlation there. But... <laughs> It's like, yeah, that's that's my trajectory. So, uh, in in Kuiper, I studied the Bible and youth ministry, and I've been doing youth ministry in Byron Center ever since that time. Uh, but today we get the chance to talk about Palm Sunday um, and what happens over this next week in the life of Jesus and what's going to go down. Um, now, whether you have heard about Palm Sunday and about Jesus, you, you've probably heard about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, whether you have heard these stories or not, right? That, that's kind of something that's known. It's, a, it's actually kind of a beautiful moment because people are waving palm branches as Jesus comes into the city. Um, and that's something we're going to talk about. But it's not actually as beautiful of a picture as we might think. Um, so over the next couple of hours, I'm going to try and help explain to you guys, a couple of hours, thanks for catching that, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and explain a little bit more about this Palm Sunday, and we're going to walk through and ask some questions about this passage. Um, and to do that, we need to talk about a few things. Uh, Passover, we're going to talk about Passover, we're going to talk about Palms, we're going to talk about Maccabees, and of course, donkeys. You cannot finish talking about the scripture without talking about donkeys, so we're going to go there as well. Uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn with me to Luke 19, and we're going to be starting at verse 28. And we're going to start by reading the whole, uh, whole scripture passage at first, and then we're going to come back and start talking about what questions might come up during it. So, uh, starting at Luke 19, verse 28, it says this. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Beth Page and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. 
They will dash you into the ground and you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Yeah, there's so much there, right? We're going we're gonna to start by diving in right in the beginning and start rolling from there. So verse, verse 28, right where we started, says, After Jesus had said this, he went on, went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Going up to Jerusalem. Why would Jesus be going up to Jerusalem? That's a great question. I was hoping you would ask that. Let's dive into that part first. See, Jesus was headed down to Jerusalem because he was a Jew. Right? He was going to celebrate what we call Palm Sunday, what we're celebrating uh, this weekend, which is the start of a festival. We're going to talk about that more later. And on Thursday of the next week, they would celebrate Passover. Like I said earlier, it's important to understand the context, <clears throat> the context of what, what's going on around the time when Jesus is living. Okay, so Passover is a big celebration that started about 2,000 years earlier, okay, before Jesus came on the scene. So 2,000 years before Jesus was alive. During that time, there was a superpower in control, um, and they were called the Egyptians, all right? And they were feared by everyone at the time. The Israelites at that time were slaves to the Egyptians because the Egyptians were the leading superpower of the world. They had the best military, they had the best weapons, um, and when you think Egypt, you think the pyramids, right? They were able to create all of these great things, and the Israelites were slaves to them. Um, the first Passover is a moment where God, through a man named Moses, freed the Israelites from slavery. So that's the moment, that's the first Passover that they're talking about, and they're coming in and celebrating that. So the central, central to the celebration of Passover is the idea and the belief that through God, anything is possible, right? With God, no, no matter how big the enemy, no matter how bad it looks, God is always present, right? So that is a little bit about what Passover is, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question about why Jesus was actually going to Jerusalem. So, let's dive into that. Reason number one, to celebrate. See, every year, if you, would, if you were Jewish, you would leave your home wherever your home was and travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And it was actually, actually quite the party. There was a scholar who talked about how many people were living in Jerusalem at that time. It was about twenty to 30,000 people. But when this holy time would come up, the holy city would fill up to about 150,000 people, right? So this, this place is just packed, right? When you think of, I want you to think maybe if you just came back from spring break and you were driving through Atlanta and there was a traffic jam, right? It's a little bit like there are people everywhere, right? Um, think about Black Friday outside of Walmart when there's only a few TVs left and everyone's like, I'm ready for this, right? It's like there are people everywhere, but they're all there to celebrate, and there's so much excitement. Okay, so uh, all they're, all, they're all there to remember a time when God delivered them from the Egyptians. So reason number one is to celebrate. Reason number two is to rehearse. All right, so Passover is described in the Bible as a Jewish festival, the word festival in the Hebrew word is mikra. All right, say that with me, mikra. Yeah, it means to rehearse. Okay, what's fascinating about that word, mikra, is that they believe that it wasn't just a time to gather. It wasn't just a time to come in and celebrate, but the festivals were a time to rehearse for something that they thought would happen again, right? When you rehearse something, you're getting ready for something that's to come. Right, so they're, that, that changed the way I looked at the story, right? When you're thinking about all these ancient Jewish people coming into town, not only celebrating, but rehearsing for what's to come, oh, that, that is just super cool. However, there's a bit of a problem with that. And that little problem has to do with who's actually ruling over them at that time. And those people are called the Romans, and that's, that's a big deal to remember because at the time 
that Jesus was coming on the scene, the Egyptians weren't the problem anymore. They weren't the superpower, and it has become the Romans. The Romans were the new global military superpower of the world. And the Romans made the Egyptians look weak. The Egyptians had nothing on the Romans. The Romans were larger and stronger and more vicious than the Egyptians could ever dream to be. Uh, Right before the Romans came on the scene, there was a kind of a torture device that was known to be as the impaling stick. Um, And that is about as bad as it sounds, right? That doesn't sound like a good thing. Um, And the Romans took that and said, we don't actually think that's bad enough. We need something that lasts longer because with the impaling stick, it's, it's painful, but it's fairly quick. All right, but they, the Romans wanted something that was going to be more gruesome and would make the people live through that longer. And they came up with the cross. And the Romans took that method and wanted people to understand that you don't mess with Rome. Right? You do not rebel against us because this is what could happen. They were even said to line the streets with crosses so that whenever people would come out of their house, they would see, if I, if I say the wrong thing, if I do the wrong thing, I could end up on one of those. There's a lot of fear, right? And this is the world that Jesus is doing his ministry in. I hope this is helpful in understanding the world that we're, we're looking at right now, right? So every year, if you're Jewish, you would head down to Passover festival to rehearse and to celebrate. And every year you would pray, you would sing songs, you would tell stories about what happened in Egypt and how God worked through Moses to deliver the Israelites from slavery. But not only that, you also waited for a new Moses to come on the scene who would lead the charge for something else. And they spoke, they spoke about the day. The day that the prophets were referring to as the day of the Lord. They were waiting for this. The day when God would take his city back. The day when God would move again and come back on the scene. The day of the Lord, the prophets said, is coming. And they were rehearsing for that. With all this happening, you can assume that Passover also kind of became a time of protest. Right? They're celebrating, they're rehearsing, but they can also see that the Romans are right there. Right? They can see, okay, maybe we're going to protest this a little bit because we're not actually happy with what's happening right now. This is not the way we were meant to live. And this is Luke's story. Right? This is how Luke's story begins with Jesus headed down to Passover. The celebration, the rehearsal, and the protest. Do you get a sense of the electricity in the air, right? You can imagine that the world Jesus is starting to, the word about Jesus is starting to get around. This is towards the end of his ministry, and he's been doing miracles. He's been raising people from the dead. He's been healing the sick. He's been feeding a ton of people, right? Word is probably starting to get out about all the good things Jesus is doing. So you have to be thinking, are the people starting to ask questions? Is this the year, right? Is this the day? Is this the day the prophets were telling us about? Will Jesus be the new Moses, right? This time, it wasn't the Egyptians. It was the Romans, and they are worse, right? But at this time, there's also a resistance movement among the Jewish people that began quietly um, and early in that time. This resistance movement was known as the Zealots, okay? Their mantra, do whatever it takes. Their propaganda slogan, Hosanna. And their symbol, the palm tree or the palm branch. So let's talk about palm branches a minute. See, because what these people do next is important. But in the book of Luke that we just read, or the part of the chapter in Luke, doesn't actually talk about palm branches, But all three other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, go into some detail about palm branches. So we're going to jump into John 12, verse 12 a minute. And it says this. The next day, and we're describing the same same story that's taking place right now. 
John 12, 12 says this. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches, went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Did you catch that? Right, they took palm branches, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? I, I won't just naturally grab a palm branch and go do that. Why did they grab those? Well, think of it this way. For important events where there were parades or different types of events like that, sometimes people bring things to wave. All right, if the president comes down the road, uh, people typically bring an American flag and wave that as the president goes by, right? There's even, uh, maybe for the Olympics, right, when an athlete wins an event that you can see a video of them kind of running down a row of people. They may have the flag on their back, and people are waving their flags as they go by. Um, There's even parades to show support for sports teams after they win the Super Bowl, something that us Detroit Lions fans will never truly get to know what it's like. (sighs) Someday. This is our year, right? (laughs) Do you get the picture, though? We wave things that bring us pride, things that mean something to us. And this is actually what's happening in Jerusalem. The palm branch means something to them. Now, to get at that, we need to step away from that story a little bit and back up about 200 years earlier. Now, at that time, the Romans are not yet in charge. They have not become the superpower they are in Jesus' time. It's the Greeks who have conquered Jerusalem. Now, the Greeks aren't in power all that long, but when they are, they they do some things that are absolutely shocking for the, Jew- the Jewish world. Now, one of their leaders named Antichus Epiphanius, I think I got that name right, put a statue of the Greek god Zeus, okay, the statue of the Greek god Zeus in the temple, right? And if you were Jewish, this was blasphemy, right? You don't put another god in our temple, right? But he didn't stop there. He, he wanted to stop worship altogether, so what he did is he, he decided to make the temple ceremonial unclean. So he brought a bunch of pigs in there and killed them at the altar. And that's another huge no-no for the Jews. Then, then he decided to kill the temple priests and the worship leaders, right? It was a dark season for these people. But it was in the middle of all this that a Jewish family known as the Maccabees rise up and say, enough. We have had enough. That is enough of this. This isn't right. We must fight back. We are going to take this city back and restore the name of our God. And so the Jewish people at the Maccabees command, do this, right? They revolt against the Greeks, and they win. And they actually reclaim the temple from the Greeks. It's a victory that's still celebrated today, and some of you might recognize the name of it. It's called Hanukkah. Right? That's the celebration of that time. But there was one small problem after their victory. After they all got home and done celebrating, they realized that they had missed one of the festivals, which is a really big deal if you're a Jew. Because in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 23, God says that you need to celebrate these specific seven festivals. And they missed it. They missed one of the festivals known as Sukkoth. So what they decide to do is because they miss the festival, they decide to just celebrate it later. So if you think about that, it's pretty much like celebrating Christmas in April because all of your grandparents are finally back from sunning themselves in Florida all winter, right? They're finally back. It's not that you don't celebrate it. You just celebrate it later, right? That's okay. And see, one of the the main parts of the festival that they missed was waving palm branches, Uh, because they'd wave these palm branches because Sukkot is a festival where they would ask God to send them rain, okay? So they're going to be waving these palm branches asking for rain. But this year, it's a little bit different, okay? They'd just gotten back from battle. They had won. So instead of like asking for rain, it's almost like a victory chant. Like, we won. We are free people now. They are celebrating. Hosanna. This, This was a victory chant, okay? And 
See, in, in those years that they were free, it was a short time, but during those years, they even minted their own coins. You can see it on the, on the screen. There's a palm branch on there, right? So they took this symbol even to this extent where it's like, we fought, we had victory, and God won. We got the temple back, right? So that was 200 years before Jesus was on the scene. 2,000 years before Jesus' time, we had the Egyptians in rule, right? And then uh, God delivered them out of that. 200 years before Jesus, we had the Greeks in rule, where we have the Maccabees come and help out there. Now let's jump back into Jesus' time. So we're back into this story now. So when when the people are waving their palm branches at Jesus, when they shout Hosanna, when they shout Jesus is king, what are they saying? Jesus, kill them, right? Kill the Romans. We will fight with you. We will get right behind you. Let's go into battle. Let's do this thing, right? Be like Moses. Be like Judas Maccabees and kill them. Be our king. Do you see that this is just dripping with revolution, right? A lot of you are thinking, it's about to go down, right? This is going to happen right here and now. But Jesus does something a little bit odd. Let's catch up in verse 29 of Luke 19. It says, As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As you untie it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And just to clear things up, the colt that they mention in this scripture passage is pretty much considered the foal of a donkey. Okay, right? So when you're picturing colt, picture a donkey. Um, now, maybe I've watched too many movies, but when I, when I th- look at this scripture passage and I think about what Jesus is going to do, I think of him jumping on a stallion and riding in there and saving the day, right? A lot like uh, what we see in the movies um, where Hans and his very helpful horse saved the day in Frozen, right? You can get the pic, right? Very helpful horse. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. But what does he say instead? Someone get me a donkey. Okay, now donkeys aren't exactly the most intimidating animals, right? I remember one of my first interactions where I, I saw a donkey for one of the first times at Cranhill Ranch. Uh, my family, once a summer, would go up there for the weekend, and we would have a blast with our church up there. And I remember seeing a donkey for the first time, and I'm like, it's kind of short, a little bit fat, not very impressive. It's, like, it's, it's not all that much going for it, right? But what I remember most is that next night I was sleeping, and at 6 a.m., this horrendous noise comes from the barn area. I'm like, what is happening? Something's dying over there. And my dad told me later, that was the donkey. That's just the noise they make. It's like, what useless animals, right? It's like, this, this just doesn't make sense. And yet, this is the animal that Jesus asked for. In that day, donkeys were a symbol for something, Um, And the donkey actually became the Jewish symbol for peace. You see, because the only time a donkey would be ridden in war is when they were going to give up. Right? You can picture that. If you're riding a donkey into war, you're saying there's no other. Like, there's nothing good we can do anymore. Like, here we go, donkey. Right? There's nothing good left. So, You're giving up. So these crowds would be thinking if Jesus is riding a donkey into Jerusalem, he's got to be waving the white flag, right? This has got to be it. He's giving up. But let's continue reading. Verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw the cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Wait a minute. That's not the reaction I was expecting the people to have. right? That's not them seeing the white flag, they are expecting 
God to fight for them in this moment. Now, where would they get that idea? See, well, during this time, people, people in that day and age would know the Old Testament. They would know their scriptures really well. They'd study it like crazy while they were in school. And they'd especially know the prophecies that the prophets would talk about with what to look for when the new Messiah was going to be there. This is what you can look for. Uh, and we're going to jump back to Zechariah a minute. He's one of the prophets who prophesied about what this would look like. And Zechariah says these words in Zechariah 9.9. 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see this is starting to play out, right? You can almost picture that the people are, are thinking, Okay, hang on. I see something happening here. This, this, we got to pay attention to this. Zechariah continues the prophecy. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule, his rule will extend from sea to sea and the river to the ends of the earth. Right? The crowd knows the prophecy. They're seeing this unfold before their eyes. He's coming on a donkey. Oh my word, right? They, and why did they wave their palm branches? Because this is a sign of the resistance movement, right? This is going to happen. They're standing in the streets clenching their palm branches and they're hoping for a new Jerusalem. Like this is happening now. Luke continues in verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Why does he weep? Because he realizes, I'm not the king they're looking for. Right? These people are not looking for me. They want someone to come in and kill the Romans, and that's not something that I'm going to do. That's not what's actually going to bring you peace. And Jesus weeps because he knows that when he refuses to do this, the people in just a few short days are going to yell, crucify him, and ask for Barabbas to be their military leader instead of Jesus because that's what he wants. You see, he weeps because he knows they're going to continue plotting against them regardless of what he says because he sees people clenching onto palm branches wanting something that will not actually give them peace. You see, some of us have maybe clenched onto a phone, right? We clench onto a phone, we don't want to let it go Right? Some of us have maybe clenched onto a phone while we're sitting with our families at a dinner table. And we clench onto the lives of other people as opposed to looking at the lives in front of us. Some of us have clenched onto a job because it's safe and because it pays, even though we feel that God might be calling us to something else. Some of us have clenched onto a busy schedule that we don't, because we don't have to deal with the stress of coming home to a house that doesn't feel like home anymore. Right? When Jesus came into the city, he cried because he could not give his children what they were offering, what, what, he, what he could offer. See, just imagine, how would this moment look different if when Jesus came into the city, instead of people clenching their palm branches, they opened their hands? Imagine what Jesus could do if we opened our hands. You see, living living life with open hands isn't just an idea. It's a posture. What would it look like instead of clenching onto something, something like an idea, so tightly that instead we open up our hands to God in those moments and pray, pray to him, right? In all these moments, we gradually make our lives more about prayer when we open our hands to be led by God to places that he wants us to go. What if we open our hands? What if we put our phones down? What if we became obedient to what Jesus has planned for us 
and said no to the busyness of our lives. God knows how the story ends in Jesus' day, right? He knows that the people are going to say no, right? And it's harder for us to let go of things because we don't actually know how our story personally ends, right? But think about, think about it this way. What if in this next week we opened our hands and we trusted that God had our best intentions in mind? We let go of our ideas and let God decide what we're going to do. Think about how and what we need to do to let go so that Jesus can be let in. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for giving us this word. I thank you for giving us the way you responded and the way you came in with the Egyptians and responded to the prayers of the people. I ask that as we try and open our hands this week that you respond in that same way. I ask that you help us let go of some things in our lives that we've been clenching onto that we're afraid to let go of because it's safe. I ask that you help us open our hands to be able to see what you might have in store for our lives. I hope that we trust you in those moments. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Thank you.